Hello and welcome to a special edition of FIM's Coffee Talk. Today we'll be talking about a different side of investing, not the usual buy or sell stuff, but rather what drives them, as in the behavioural aspect of investing. And to do this, we are fortunate enough to have with us a renowned behavioural scientist, the multi-talented Dr. Joanne Jung, who is also an applied microeconomist, an interdisciplinary researcher who works on consumer and household decision-making for vulnerable populations, an author of almost 100 peer-reviewed articles in economics, medical and public health journals. She even worked on projects around the world ranging from Singapore to Iraqi Kurdistan. On top of all this, guess what? She even has a day job as the CEO of Research for Impact Private Limited. And guess what? She also moonlights as a research fellow of the Institute for Capital Market Research Malaysia. But best of all, my favourite personal point about her is she's a fellow Trekkie. On that note, I welcome you, Dr. Joanne, to today's Coffee Talk session. Thanks very much, Kalyan. It's my pleasure to be here with FIM on this journey through the exciting new area of behavioural finance. On that note, I wouldn't be surprised if Dr. Joanne has boldly gone where no man has gone before. So let us start by asking her, what actually does a behavioural scientist do and how does this relate to investments? Well, behavioural scientists actually work across a various, uh, various domains. We work in health, we work in finance, we work in social care, and we work also in the consumer space, in the marketing space as well. Uh, behavioural scientists, broadly speaking, do two things. We use the principles of cognitive science to help people understand decision making, to try to pick apart why people make choices. Is it because of environmental constraints? Is it because of their capabilities? Or is it because of their internal motivations? So we help individuals and decision makers, policy makers, private sector uh, parties, nonprofits, all to understand why people make decisions. The other thing that we do is we try to help people shape those decisions. We try to help people design products, policies, programs, and services that change people's behavior based on these underlying drivers. So we are part of program design and product design, hopefully to make the world a better place. You mentioned earlier that behavioural science has been around for a long time. But I'm sure that behavioural science has not come into something like a pandemic context. So the pandemic has definitely affected us in many ways. What are the most glaring behavioural shifts that you observe in investment patterns or habits? I think one of the things that we saw during the pandemic is that Firstly, for a long time, we have been trying to get people into the markets. And we, a lot of the question that we had was how we get naive investors or new investors to enter the market. In the pandemic, what we saw actually was, surprisingly, a surge in participation. A lot of people actually coming into the market for the first time, including people who had not participated before. So actually, that's a huge behavioral shift for us, mostly because at the end of the day, sometimes some of these behaviors that we see with new investors are fairly different from seasoned investors in the market. So these are people who are experiencing the financial markets for the first time and making a lot of decisions that for them at the end of the day are very new. So one of the big behavioral shifts that we have seen really is not asking anymore, how do we get people to participate? But really in asking ourselves, how do we get people to now continue to participate, participate in the right way and make optimal decisions for the long term? And how do we turn some of that curiosity and new participation into sustained and healthy financial behaviours. But that's on participation. In terms of other observations, where has your research identified when it comes to defining a rational investor? Has the pandemic or even vaccines made or maintained investors uh, in their irrational state or made them more rational? So during the pandemic itself, as opposed to the post-pandemic state, I think we found firstly that at the beginning of the pandemic, people were making decisions that were irrational in one specific way, which is that people were confused. A lot of times people were upset and people were very triggered and emotional. And so at that time, I think we saw a lot of responses that were driven, very driven by panic. They were a little driven by fear. In the middle of the pandemic, what we began to see was that people were more socially isolated. Okay, people were a little bored. <laughs> And that at the end of that day, what was difficult was to sustain people's interest. And so some of the biases that we saw during that time began to shift 
to having people really sort of think through things and really worry that people's attention was not quite there. So even though people's behavior was, uh, was, it was irrational throughout, I think, and, and people's behavior is irrational, everyday behavior is irrational, the root causes of those behaviors shifted quite a bit. And now that we're in a, what, what we, we tend to think is a post-pandemic stage, although never say never, every time we say we're in a, the pandemic is done, it, it comes back <laughs> in a whole new form. I think what we're really interested in is to see if people's behavior slips back to their previous patterns, if people who weren't investing before the pandemic stop investing, or if some of these patterns are sustained because of inertia, if perhaps people then continue on the trajectory that they set without actively thinking about their decisions going forward, or if they're actually going to be catalyzed into being more active and sustaining some of those behaviors in a more mindful way. I think some of those actually, quite frankly, we don't know yet. Uh, with respect to, for example, vaccines, which you mentioned, we saw that during the pandemic, a lot of people, because of the circumstances that they were in, adopted vaccination, but that this behavior has not really translated into adopting all kinds of vaccination after the pandemic is done. And we also know that a lot of the behaviors that we saw during the pandemic related to, for example, increased hand hygiene, thinking a little bit about interactions, some of that behavior has gone away. Mm -hmm. So I think that the jury is still out. We continue to evolve. Yeah, and it's exciting, actually. It's an exciting time for research as well. I suppose only time will tell. Mm. And uh, it would be of great interest for all of us. Once you have some outcome from those research, you could share it with us or even the general public. Mm -hmm. One consistent thing pre- and even post-pandemic is people invest purely to make money. How does behavioural science help them achieve that? So behavioural science actually helps individuals when it's used in the right way. So working, for example, with a financial advisor that understands that individuals who are subject to everyday emotions, everyday pressures, everyday stresses need support to focus on long-term goals that help them think through things rationally in moments when their own decision-making is a little compromised. Or for example, for investors who realize themselves that they need, for example, to set long-term plans to help them to avoid biases in their day-to-day decision-making. All of those are instances in which behavioral science helps investors to reach their appropriate goals in a way that is more effective as well as more efficient. On the other hand, in the wrong hands, behavioral science can also affect uh, investors wrongly. So when, for example, behavioral science is used by people who perpetuate financial scams to prey on people's fears, to take advantage of people's limited attention and other things like that, then behavioral science works in the opposite direction. So behavioral science actually is a force for good um, in the right hands. If we become more self-aware of our own biases, that's always great. But at the end of the day, it's a tool that can be used for good ends as well as for, for actually the wrong ends. No, on this double-edged sword mm. note, uh, um, what's your conclusion then? Are you seeing more people use it for the good or for evil stuff? <laughs> um, I think, you know, sometimes we talk about the concept of the dark nudge. So a mm -hmm. nudge is, you know, anything that we find in the choice environment that moves people towards a particular decision without really altering their economic, uh, their economic incentives and, and sort of focusing on their choice environment. And what we call dark nudges are aspects of, you know, altering the choice environment to move people in a way that is counter to their interests or for the interests of others. I think dark nudges have always been present. This, uh, the stakeholders in the financial markets for their own ends have tried to manipulate investors, so this is not new. But I think that the presence of dark nudges today um, is higher. The incidence of scams is higher. The use of new technologies to find and on a mass level target people is higher. So I, I do see that that is something that has increased. On the other hand, our own awareness, um, regulatory awareness, but also the awareness of firms in the financial sector that want to promote financial well-being has also increased. So I think at the end of the day, the battle between good and evil will continue uh, really forever. Um, we just have a new set of tools uh, with which to continue that fight. Well said. Globally, post-pandemic, retirement savings, retirement plans has been on all headlines uh, where most people are affected and their retirement plans retirement savings have been eroded by the pandemic. The expected behaviour pattern everywhere is to save more, work more and work longer. Are those the right behavioural habits? Is there an alternative to it? 
we would all love there to be an alternative to it. I think at the end of the day, you know, if we had a magic bullet uh, that took away some of these hits and filled that in, I think we'd all be, be delighted and we, we love a quick fix. It's fundamentally in our natures. Some of these things, saving more, working more, are inevitabilities. And where we use behavioral science is to really help people to stay the course. One, we, one thing that we know is that in order to, re to reach those goals, retreating from the markets into what we think of as safe havens, pulling out and really kind of going back into assets that are not going to deliver that in the long term can feel very comforting at the end of the day, but that these are sort of knee-jerk responses that we need to sort of stay away from. We need to continue to focus on the fact that regardless of what happened, with the pandemic or with regular short-term fluctuations, investors need to save and invest for the long term. That hasn't changed. That behavior as a pole star for long-term financial well-being will always remain. The traditional message to the younger generation is always about saving, saving up or saving for a rainy day. Has your work ever led to investing, investing more or even investing for a rainy day? In fact, I think uh, all of the work that we do to encourage young people to save, in fact, is very, very directly connected to having them invest for the long term. Uh, we know that actually investing young at an, at, an, at an early age is really what brings those long term returns. And we also know that confusing the fact that putting money in a safe asset without considering things like inflation, without considering things the way the market is going, is actually not a safe strategy. And that thinking about investing should not be separate or mentally accounted for differently than saving. So certainly, I think we want to think, have young people think about the fact that simply putting money away is not the end of the journey. And a lot of the work that we have done is to help people understand that investing, especially at a young age, is not something to be put off, is not something that is inaccessible, is not something that is too difficult, and is not something that requires a huge amount of finance or experience to get started with. Definitely, this is something, a message that we want people to take away and not simply think that putting money in a savings account, that's necessary, but not sufficient. Let's put theory into practice. Assuming you sell financial products and you have clients or potential clients who are skeptical about investing now, what would you do to convince them? That's a great question. There are a couple of things that I would do. And of course, things that you would specifically do for a specific client would vary very much based on their individual needs and preferences. But I think the most important things, or three most important things actually, that we would take into account when we're looking at someone who's coming into the market, especially now, is to really understand first and foremost that we need to put client needs first. And so we need to frame the investment decision really as meeting client needs rather than selling a specific product. So I would start with the client goals and make it very clear to the client what their individual goals are and what products or services are necessary to meet those goals rather than coming in product first. And the second thing is to understand really that some of the hesitancies that people have around investing come from personal experience, come from sometimes lack of financial literacy, and sometimes at the end of the day simply come from the fact that there's too much information out there, it seems too complex, that people get a lot of conflicting messages. So the second thing that I would really do is try to work through the information that the person has and really try to ensure that they understand the basis of what's going on and that they're able to translate good, credible information about a set of products that's suitable for them and not take for granted that they would be able to sort it out for themselves. Finally, the third thing I think which would be key for someone actually really, again, taking that step into the financial markets is the importance of establishing a long-term relationship. So one and done is not necessarily the way that a new investor wants to approach the markets, but really having a reliable way to say, I'm interested in what you're doing, I'm interested in how this is working out for you as a strategy to build your wealth in the long term for your own well-being. So if I were in that situation, I would want to make sure that that relationship is not necessarily transactional at its heart, but really follows through from the point of view of helping support someone to meet their financial goals over the longer term. Dr. Joanne, from a behavioral science perspective, what are your three takeaway points for investors? I think the three things that I have investors remember is firstly, that as an individual in the market, 
we feel emotions and that, that does drive us because we are human beings. But at the end of the day, having a rational systematic plan about how we're going to invest in the financial markets and hewing to that in the face of our emotions, in the face of our stresses, is really key. It's perfectly reasonable to be human, but at the same time, it's important for us to recognize when we can make better decisions and stick to those decisions. The second thing I'd like to have people to take away is that it's very critical for us to remember that financial education and financial literacy is key. No amount of behavioral science and no amount of support from external parties can take away the fact that having individual competency and individual knowledge is the core from which good decision making starts. And last but not least, I think what I think I'd like people to take away is that it's important for us when we think about investing to acknowledge that we might be hesitant, to acknowledge that there are things in the market that we need to be aware of, that there are risks that are real and that we need to account for, but that we shouldn't let fear, greed, panic govern our choice to stay in or stay out. We want to proceed with caution, but we want to proceed at the end of the day. And those, are my, those would be my key takeaways. Thank you, Dr. Joanne, for sharing with us on how your work has impacted investment decision making. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for participating in one of the deepest film coffee talk to date. On that note, do you have any final words to say to the audience, Doctor? No, actually, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It's been a delight to be here. And I suppose just as a fellow Trekkie, all I can say is, uh, hope we all live long and prosper. Live long and prosper indeed.